basically, General LeMay told you that if it's not broken, uh, you don't have to fix it. But, but there were things you wanted to change, too, certainly. Well, actually, General LeMay was telling me, go change it. He was, he was telling me life does not need to be miserable in SAC. Mm -hmm. That uh, there isn't any reason why people in SAC uh, can't be treated as well as people in TAC. Mm -hmm. And so I went there with the intention of, of carefully separating the demands of the nuclear enterprise uh, where all things that have anything to do with nuclear weapons or nuclear forces, where I don't want any innovation, you will follow the rules, you'll follow the rules exactly, uh, you will do it perfectly. But in everything else, I want you to improve the quality of life. I want you to think, make things better for your people. I told the wing commanders, uh, you're going to have to be a bit schizophrenic to succeed in SAC. That is, rigid adherence in things nuclear, and I want you to take risks and be innovative in all other things. And my guarantee to you is you can do that because in things nuclear, it's up to you. The risk is yours. And in being innovative, the risk is mine, and I will cover you. I found that SAC did in less than a year what it took us three years to do with tech. Now, part of it was because they had this model that, that indeed you can do this. You can pull yourself up to another level. But part of it was just because of the commitment and dedication of people in SAC. They were just different. Uh, I have to give you one little anecdote about they were just different. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to Grand Forks Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. I went to the maintenance facility. Mm -hmm. And the maintenance facility was miserable. People working with poor lighting inside of a big hangar, not well heated. And my concept was if you expect people to give you a professional, a professional performance, you have to give them a professional environment. So I said to the wing commander, why aren't we doing something about this? He said, oh, sir, we've had a project in for years. Uh, we just can't get the money to do it. And I said, why? Some of it cost two and a half million dollars. He said, how much would it cost if you did it yourself with self-help? He said, well, can I tell you tomorrow? So the next day, he told me, he says, it'll cost, we can do it for $400,000. I said, do it. I'll send you the money. And I said, I'm going to come back in six months and look at it. Four months later, I get a phone call. He said, it's done. Come look at it. I came and I looked at it. And as you walked into it, it's a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. Nice shops, good lighting. As you walked into it, you're looking down a hall the length of the hangar. And it was perfectly straight. It was perfect. And I said, how did you get this done in four months? He said, sir. <coughs> Sometimes on the weekend, we'd have 500 people out here working on this. <laughs> I said, how could you build a straight hall with 500 people? He said, well, sir, these were sack maintenance people. <laughs> anyway, you know, I could tell a dozen of those anecdotes. I won't. But that's just, it was this. I know what you want. You've given me the resources to do it, and we will do it. So that's why it was such a great experience. <laughs> Talk a little about the forces that you had when you were. <clears throat> well, we were, and I guess as Commander Sack, I was kind of the beneficiary <laughs> of uh, the cycle of modernization that takes place every 30 years or so in the strategic business. That uh, <clears throat> we, we had just finished the Minuteman III, uh, completely deploying it. Uh, the Peacekeeper missile was just entering into service that uh, we were reducing the B-52 force to the most modern version. We were fielding the B-1. So we were actually 
sort of at the at the end of a very large strategic modernization cycle in in SAC. So in a lot of respects, you know, that gave you great advantages, but in other respects, mm -hmm. we were having to do a lot of innovation. We were introducing new systems, mm -hmm. and uh, there were more to come. Uh, and in fact, we were just on the leading edge of the B1 and the, and, uh, <coughs> the Peacekeeper missile, et cetera, but, but we were preparing for those. So we were in this era of a lot of change in the force. Mm -hmm. The basic mission, though, was unchanged. That uh, some of our equipment seemed to be very old. Uh, we bought the last tanker, I think, in 1966. Mm -hmm. That, uh, and we had a very large force. From a professional standpoint, uh, we really did have a very solid handle on how to operate the forces, how to make the forces effective. Strategy was clear. Policies were clear. Very strong support from the president was clear. So it was a very clear mission in which people were very proud to be a part of. To continue discussing operations, uh, SAC had had ICBMs on alert since the Atlas D in the late 1950s. Uh, it had gone through the cycle of uh, the Minuteman. Uh, you were kind of at the end of when you were chief of staff of the modernization programs that the Air Force was doing for its ICBM force. Now, w w one of the differences had to be a difference between the ICBM and the bomber force was if you were manning a missile silo, uh, you you simulated and you exercised and you practiced, but you didn't actually do the operation. Uh, if you did, the balloon had gone up and we were at war. And uh, remote, but very remote, that you would uh, redo it again. Uh, as opposed to that, the B-52 pilots uh, had flown combat missions in Vietnam. They, they were able to fly all the time. Uh, it, it had to be something different to, to do that kind of operation as opposed to the, the ICBM operation. Uh, how did you react to that? The, uh, well, I didn't need to react to it. I just needed to listen to the troops. And that uh, I can't exactly explain how, how this culture was created or sustained. But the missile crews never had any question about the importance of what they did. You know, you go out and you sit in that launch control facility for three days, and uh, the first place they were always busy because they were always in the middle of exercises and practices and training. But their attitude was every bit as dedicated and and interested in their mission uh, as the bomber crew. That, uh, you know, for several years I'd gone to the bomb comp because SAC participated in the bomb comp with her F-11Ds, F which we always won that class because the F-11D mm -hmm. was, and my SAC friends were always very, a bit resentful of that, but <coughs> I'd only been at SAC for about two months when it was time for the missile competition out of Vandenberg. And I thought, oh yeah, this is great. I'm gonna go out and, and participate in a missile competition. How can that be interesting? Well, I tell you, they blew me away. And the spirit, the excitement, uh, the demands of performance in the missile competition made the bomb cop look like a high school dance. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really, it was really a revelation to me. So I did a few things that uh, I gave them a distinctive uniform, distinctive work uniform. The, uh, we undertook to really modernize the launch control facilities. By the way, it took 20 years to get that done, but we, we did it. So I probably, paid special attention to the to the ICBM force 
for the reason that you stated, but uh, it wasn't because I didn't have any confidence in them. By the way, when we exercised the ICBM force, the exercises always took them to the end. It always took them to the, you turn the keys and you launch. So while the probability they would ever have to do it was very low, and they understood the SAC motto, pieces are perfection, that is that they didn't want to ever have to do it, uh, we certainly created a culture that says, if I have to do it, I will do it. And we reinforced that culture, not to put them in a warfighting mode, mm -hmm. but to put them in a true, a true deterrence mode. Mm -hmm. Because we felt that if we were going to convince the Soviets that these lieutenants and captains would turn the key, we had to convince the lieutenants and captains that they would turn mm -hmm. the keys. And I don't think there's any question that that is the situation.